Dr. V. Chandrasekhar is working as lecturer in philosophy in the Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda College since 1996. He has been awarded the degree of PhD by the University of Madras for his work in the area Yoga and Analytical Psychology. He has been teaching Indian philosophy, Western philosophy and recent European philosophy for undergraduate and postgraduate students. He has participated in many seminars and presented papers in a variety of topics. He has also reviewed two books, In Ethics and Indian Culture, published by the Tamil Nadu Textbook Society for Plus Two Course. Welcome to UGC series of lectures in philosophy. I have today two of my students, Mr. Badri. Hello, sir. And Mr. Tilak. Hello, sir. So far, I have been talking to you about the pre-Socratic period in the Greek thought. This particular lecture is the fifth lecture in our series. Here, today I am planning to start off with a continuation from what we did in the last class. That is the continuation of the talk on the Pythagorean philosophy. In fact, in the earlier class, I was talking to you about the views and the, ethical, uh, the philosophy of the Pythagoreans. We will be continuing that because Pythagoras is more famous for his ethical principles. So, we will be dealing with that in this episode. Then, we will also look into the transition of the Greek thought from metaphysics to positive science. After the Pythagoreans, we have a kind of a transition in the pre-Socratic period that is known as the transition from the metaphysics to positive science. This comes in the form of a school called the Eliotic school that we will be dealing later after completing the lecture on Pythagoras. We will continue with the views of Pythagoras and here I must tell you as I told you in the last class, what we know about Pythagoras is only through the works of Aristotle and others. So, let us see how Aristotle brings out the view of Pythagoras to us. Aristotle's understanding. Aristotle says, numbers were assigned to things by the Pythagoreans. For instance, anything that man deals with is assigned a number by the Pythagoreans, says Aristotle. Like for example, marriage is assigned the number 5. We may wonder how Pythagoreans say that the first masculine number 3 and the first feminine number 2 put together or added together becomes 5. Hence, marriage is regarded as 5. In fact, we know that marriage is the union of man and woman. Maybe because of this that Pythagoreans view marri or give the number 5 to marriage. Similarly, the concept justice we all know is also assigned a number. We will see how. Justice they say is returning equal for equal. Now, among numbers, what returns equal? It is only the square numbers return equal. Hence, some Pythagoreans say that 4 is the number that represents justice because 4 is the square of 2, 2 into 2. But here, Pythagoreans are not very clear because even 9 is considered to be justice because 9 is a, a square of 3. So, Pythagoreans are not very clear as to the identification of a particular number to justice. However, they do identify all concepts or all things in this world as numbers. We will continue. Numbers also determine shapes of things. Sir, you had mentioned that numbers also determine the shapes of uh, things. Can you explain uh, or uh, illustrate this with an example? It is a good question. Now, I will try to illustrate how numbers are assigned to forms and shapes and here I shall look into the views of Aristotle or the understanding of Aristotle to bring out this. Let us see that now. Aristotle says 1 refers to a point, 2 a line, 3 a surface, 4 solid, 5 physical qualities, 6 animation, 7 intelligence, health, love, wisdom and this identification goes on and on. I must tell you the identification between number and forms or matter is a ongoing process. They have identified everything with respect to number, but one thing is certain it is a bit arbitrary. We cannot uh, say how they come to this kind of a identification. It is not very clear. 
yet they do that. But maybe as I told you in the last class, there is there are three principles namely proportion, harmony and order which I explained to you in the last class. Maybe because of this factor, Pythagoreans come to this conclusion and identify numbers with everything. Further, Arist Aristotle says that numbers were represented by geometrical patterns. We will see that now. Now, you see a triangle over here comprising of 10 dots. Here, this represents the number 10. Number 10 is considered to be sacred number and is expressed in the form of this diagram. This diagram I showed you had 10 dots. So, what the Pythagorean says is the number 10 may be a combination of the first 4 integers 1, 2, 3 and 4. I will just show you here 1, 2, 3 and 4. This is how they try to bring out the identification between number and forms. Now, let me conclude some of the views that we have seen so far. Pythagoras was famous for introducing the doctrine of metempsychosis. I told about it in the last class. Come on, Mr. Tillich, can you tell what this metempsychosis stands for? So, it is a transmigration of soul. Yes, metempsychosis is a term which talks about transmigration of soul which the Pythagoreans believed in. Secondly, central fire identified with the unit is a characteristic doctrine of the Pythagoreans. Here, I was trying to tell you that number is the ultimate and the Pythagoreans identified fire to be the central principle and that they identified with the unit and hence this is a signal contribution of the Pythagoreans. Thirdly, earth and sun revolved around the fire. Now, students you all know about geocentric view and the heliocentric view. That is earlier on people believed that the earth was the center of the universe while all other planets including the sun revolved around the earth. Then came Copernicus who said that the sun is the center and all other planets revolved around the sun. Here Pythagoras gives a different explanation. He says that both earth and sun revolve around the central fire. In fact, some scholars say that Copernicus may have got the suggestion of the heliocentric view from this view because prior to Pythagoras, it was believed that the earth was the center while all the all other planets revolved around the earth. But Pythagoras said that both earth and sun revolved around the central fire. Now, we saw the ideas of Pythagoras, the philosophy of the Pythagoras or the Pythagoreans for that matter. Now, there is a feeling among scholars that this philosophy of the Pythagoreans is a strange blend of mysticism with the development of mathematics. We will see that now. Mystic side of the Pythagorean system is numbers dictating hierarchy, ritual for religious life and the purification of the soul. Mathematical side of number, we have the Pythagoras theorem. Here, there is also another view that Pythagoras seems to have performed certain miracles. This is also reported by Aristotle. So, as a result, many people think him to be more of a mystic. So, I will just talk to you about, about that now. Aristotle reports that Pythagoras first studied mathematics and later also indulged in miracle mongering. That is, once upon a time, a ship was about to enter the dock in his area. At that time, he foretold his people that this particular ship contained a corpse in it. Secondly, he also mentioned the place where a bear was supposed to be found and he also mentioned to the Pythagoreans about the strife that was to befall Metapontum that is a place where he lived at the end. These are some of the miracles that is performed by that is supposed to have been performed by Pythagoras. Uh, as a result, people feel that he is more of a mystic. Callimachus, a poet, recognizes Pythagoras as the first to draw triangles and polygons and to bisect the circle. Scholars maintain that his teaching, namely the teaching of Pythagoras, can be divided into two, mathematical, metaphysical and moral. Sir, you said that the relationship between the number and matter is not clear. 
can you name any pythagorean who has tried to explain the relationship between number and matter yes now the scholars are not very clear as to how numbers can be assigned to things and how numbers can determine the role of matter yet some pythagoreans have tried to talk on these lines i'll just tell you one particular pythagorean by name philolaus philolaus tried to bring out the relationship between number theory and matter on the base of the following idea quality of matter depends upon the number of sides of its smallest particles philolaus mentions that the quality of any matter depends upon the number of sides that the smallest particle of that particular substance has got in fact it is on this basis that pythagoreans consider fire to be the ultimate or the finer substance because fire is represented by the pythagoreans in the form of a regular shape in fact there are five regular shapes of which pythagoreans accepted three regular shapes they are tetrahedra fire tetrahedra is that object which has got four sides now the smallest particle of fire has got four sides and hence it is referred to as tetrahedra and since it is the minimum number of sides that is aware that, that can be seen pythagoreans consider fire to be the ultimate substance secondly we have the cube earth is said to be a cube cube is a sub solid which has got six sub sides and then we have dodecahedron dodecahedron is the substance or the solid which has got 12 sides universe is said to be the, that that's why we have first the fire and then the earth and then universe this is how fire comes to be the ultimate principle as accepted by the pythagoreans is that clear now we come to the most important point of the pythagorean philosophy that is the ethical views of pythagoras because here i must tell you i have been telling you that pythagoras and pythagoreans are more famous for their ethical views for their contribution to ethics and ethics you all know deals with how man ought to live the pythagoreans were more inclined to bring out and tell the world how man ought to live here the contribution of pythagoras is very very important i told you that the views of pythagoras and the pythagoreans regarding the ethics is more important and we will go into that now that is the most important contribution of the pythagoreans let us see them now pythagoreans were rigorous and ascetic pythagoreans insisted upon utmost purity of life to them body is the prison or tomb here i must tell you the ethical ideals of pythagoreans were very very strict they they followed very strict something like uh, we know as indians we know that the jains followed a very very strict life especially the jaina ascetics something similar to that the pythagoreans also were very very strict and ascetic they insisted upon the utmost purity of life further to that they considered body as a kind of a place where the soul resides i spoke to you about the transmigration of the soul wherein just as we change our shirts the soul changes from one body to another be it man to man or human being to another species as a kind of a creature or something like that but there the soul is a substance which resides in the body this is what the pythagoreans say that's why they consider the body as a kind of a tomb or a prison then lastly one must not attempt to obtain release by suicide here i have a interesting point from the pythagoreans so far in the ethics we always deal with non injury to other creatures pythagoreans go a step further than that they say that we must not stop with non injury to other creatures we must not even injure ourselves that is we know about the concept of suicide how man tries to commit suicide to put an end to his life here pythagoreans condemn that because for them body is the gift of god and we have no right to injure our body that is the highest principle that we see 
these are the ethical ideals propagated by the Pythagoreans and in fact because of the strictness there are lot of people who are against that and we will see them later. But before that what is the role of the Pythagoreans in the political scene that is what we have to see now. Sir, I do agree that uh, the Pythagoreans will uh, emphasize more on the ethical aspect, but I have a strong feeling that their philosophy is uh, more mystical rather than ethical. Uh, can I have your re reaction on this point? Yes. Now, your question is a very pertinent question here because from our discussion so far, I have been dealing more with the ideals that probably we take as philosophy, but looks more of a mystical side. But this is precisely the reason why Pythagoras and his theory were criticized by so many people. And in fact, it is pertinent for us to know the context of the Pythagoreans. In fact, Pythagoreans did not have anything to do with politics at that time. But because of their ideas, when they lived at Croton, when Pythagoras formed the society of Pythagoreans at Croton, they, the Pythagoreans even conquer, had to uh, rule the Croton, the place of Croton for some time. But because of the strict ethical principles, they could not survive and lot of people as it was pointed out by Badri, this ideas though they were strict, they were very, very mystical and totally uh, no, not accounted for. Therefore, the people try to work against that and in fact, Pythagoreans many of them were even killed or persecuted and some of them left. In fact, Pythagoras himself left Croton and settled at Metapontum and where he is supposed to have died. And as Badri pointed out, this particular views of Pythagoras is not very, very clear. In fact, there are a lot of criticisms here that we will see now. Some people say that Pythagorean philosophy is a crude philosophy and lastly Pythagorean philosophy is criticized as fetal mysticism. These are the criticisms against Pythagorean's philosophy we saw. But now the first period of the Greek thought namely the pre-Socratic philosophy was so far looking at reality from the views of Thales, Anaximander, Anaximenes, Pythagoras, etc. But then we saw that the, it was more of a cosmology as is, as, as is the case with understanding reality that which is outside. But in this endeavor, it was more metaphysical. Of course, in the case of Pythagorean philosophy, we saw that it was more of a mathematical metaphysical, yet it was metaphysical. But the first period saw a transition that is what we are going to see now, from now on. That we find in the philosophy of the Eleatics. This is where we have the transformation of thought from metaphysics to positive science. Eleatics is a kind of philosophical school. It is founded in the place called Elia, which is, which, are, which is part of Italy, South Italy and the school of philosophers which who spoke from that area are known as Eleatics. With the philosophy of the Eleatics, we come to see a kind of a transformation of thought of the Greek thought especially the pre-Socratic is rather than analyzing the universe in terms of earth, water, fire, number. Here we are trying to analyze universe in terms of science. In fact, we can even say that this particular development in the pre-Socratic period resulted in a kind of a quarrel between science and philosophy that we will see with respect to a particular philosophy namely Xenophanes later and that is why this particular period of pre-Socratic period is held to be a transformation. Let us see the Eleatics now and the most important philosophers in this group are Xenophanes, Parmenides and others. However, Xenophanes is considered to be the founder of the Eleatic school by some scholars while some scholars say that Parmenides is the founder. We will start with Xenophanes now. Xenophanes is more of a religious reformer than a philosopher. Why? Because he attacked the popular Greek notions of God. 
God was considered to be having a form just like the humans. Not only that, the Greeks also thought of God to possess the qualities that we know that every man possesses. As a result, it is not only the positive qualities, even some of the negative qualities that we find in man are ascribed to God. This was attacked by Xenophanes. Therefore, Xenophanes is considered more to be a religious reformer. He tried to reform the ideas with respect to the religion, with respect to the popular ideas and religion more than giving a cosmology as his predecessors. Xenophanes is set up born at Colophon, which is over here. This place is presently Turkey, but this whole place was Greece once upon a time and this is the Italy. Now, he is born at Colophon, then his, his set of come to Athens that we will see later. This is the Ionia coast where he, he was born. He is then settled at Athens. In fact, I must tell you one thing here. Athens is the city known to all of us in Greece. For the simple reason, Socrates, Plato all belong to this particular area. But in pre-Socratic time, Athens does not come into the picture at all till the time of Xenophanes. That is what we saw earlier also. We never mentioned about Athens in the earlier talk, but now we come to that because Xenophanes came to Athens from Colophon. Now, Xenophanes views on God. We will just look into the ideas of Xenophanes on God. As I told you earlier, he attacked the earlier conceptions of God in order to conceive a purer and nobler conception of God. Seems to be the originator of the quarrel between science and philosophy. As I told you earlier, I was talking to you about the attack of Xenophanes on the popular conception. Why? We know that God is a supreme being. That is how we understand God. But then, if God is to be identified with even the negative qualities that man has got, we may conclude that God is after all another man. But Xenophanes could not agree with that. If God is a supreme being, then he cannot be characterized by any negative quality is the idea of Xenophanes. Instead, he wanted to have a nobler and pure idea of God. That is why he criticizes this. Now, this particular idea of Xenophanes seems to be the origin of the quarrel between science and philosophy. We saw earlier with respect to Anaximander, etc., who were more of a philosopher and also contributed in the area of science with respect to building bridges or uh, make uh, uh, drawing maps, etc. But then with the advent of Xenophanes and his attack on religion and idea of God, we find a kind of a dichotomy between science and philosophy that took shape at that time, which is very, very prominent even till today. That is the first view that we can look in the, in the case of Xenophanes. Secondly, he was against polytheism but held to pantheism. Polytheism we know is the belief in many gods, whereas pantheism is looking at the world as God. That is, earlier Greeks believed in many kinds of God. We as Hindus, we know because Hinduism is a uh, polytheistic religion. Similarly, the early Greeks also spoke about God in many forms. However, Xenophanes attacked this and said that God or the divine being is only one. Here, it is. it seems to have suggested Parmenides to his conclusion that there is only one reality in the world and that is being. That is how we, we, he comes to it. However, I must also tell you regarding the, the discussion about the originator of the Eleatic school. Some scholars, as I told you earlier, deal say that uh, Xenophanes is the founder of Eleatic school, but we do not know. Uh, one thing is sure, Xenophanes uh, was not born in Elia. He was born at Colophon, because Elia is form, forming part of Italy, while uh, the area of Italy, while Colophon form, for, forms part of Turkey on the other side. Therefore, he was not born there. Secondly, there is no record about Xenophanes visit to Ilia. Hence, people, some scholars say that he may not be the founder. According to them, Parmenides is the originator of the school of Ilia. But then, 
this particular point that I mentioned regarding the polytheism, the, re, regarding the attack on polytheism and acceptance of one God is a point that suggested Parmenides. That is why we bring in Xenophon's here. Then thirdly, God cannot be compared to the humans. Earlier on I said that Xenophon's attacked the view that God's cannot, uh, that God was understood in terms of the human being. But we also saw how qualities were ascribed to God as the case with human beings, wherein we even, they even attributed certain negative qualities. As a result, Xenophon's was against looking into God as a human being. There are some other views which we will look into later. Let me now summarize what we did so far. I started off with the ideas of Pythagoras. In fact, I continued where, from where I left last in the last class. But the main point that we saw today is regarding the ethical side of his teaching. We will just summarize the whole thing now. The ethical views of the Pythagoreans, this is what we saw earlier because that comes, to, that forms the main crux of their theory. And then the transition of Greek thought from metaphysics to positive science, wherein I have introduced the views of Xenophanes on God and universe. However, there are other philosophers here, especially Parmenides, Empedocles and Anaxagoras, which we will be dealing later after completion of the views of Xenophanes. That we will do in the next class. Now, some important questions that you can expect. Is the Pythagorean philosophy a futile mysticism? explain. In fact, uh, Badri was talking about it. Then bring out the ethical views of the Pythagoreans in the light of their theory of transmigration of soul. Thirdly, discuss the transformation of metaphysics to positive sciences in the philosophy of Xenophanes. Fourth, explain briefly the views of Xenophanes on God. Here, the views of God, the Xenophanes on God is to continue and then we will be dealing with the other views from which we will see how the transformation from metaphysics to positive sciences has taken shape in the form of the philosophy of Parmenides, the Anaxagoras and Empedocles, which we will do later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank sir. you, sir.